Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces here. Uh, it is wonderful to have you all here. Join us for Interactions Live, a live webinar series brought to you by the Ontario Society for Environmental Education, or OC. Uh, for those of you out there who may not know who we are, uh, OC is a professional organization whose members are elementary, secondary, and post-secondary teachers and um, environmental educators at centers and pretty much anyone and everyone who's dedicated to the promotion and improvement of environmental education. Um, my name is Allison Elwood and I'm a new volunteer with OC and I'm coming to you from the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississaugas of Scuba Island First Nation. Uh, wherever you are, please take a moment to acknowledge the land that you are on as we deepen our commitment toward learning the truth about the land on which we currently teach, learn and live. Uh, tonight, I'm privileged to introduce Jade Harvey Barrel. Uh, she is a woman of many talents uh, as the Outreach and Events Manager for, non for a nonprofit, the Outdoor Learning Store and Take Me Outside. Uh, she's the owner of Stoked on Science and has been working in environmental education for 15 years. Jade is the co-host of Earthy Chats, a podcast she does with Ian Shanahan from Green Teacher. Um, and if you haven't heard it before, uh, be sure to check it out as they've covered a wide variety of topics geared toward teaching and learning outside. And it's been really fun to see Jade and actually have a chat with her because I feel like I know her. Well, I've listened to her podcast before and they're great. Um, we're excited to learn about ways we might spice up and wild our nature walks this evening and learn about the 100 meter field trip. Thank you, Jade, very much for being here. Uh, she's also generously offered two $50 gift cards to two lucky participants this evening. So be sure to stay on until the end when we do something amazing uh, to get them. Uh, Jade, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Janelle and Alison, for that wonderful um, introduction. I'm uh, going to get going and share my screen. And we can get going. You can see that. Okay, beautiful. Uh, so hello everyone, um, I'm so pleased um, and proud to join OC uh, this evening for Tools and Resources to Wake Up and Wild Your Walk. Uh, so that's me out in the wilderness. Um, so I'm originally from the U United Kingdom. Uh, I came to Turtle Island in 2015 and I reside uh, in Revelstoke, BC. Um, which is the primary First Nations traditional and unceded territory of the Snyx people. Uh, this is the land of the bull trout for them uh, and also shared, utilised, traded upon uh, and in by the Tanaha, the Shishwemek uh, and the Okanagan Silks people. Uh, for the Tanaha, uh, this uh, Revelstoke is the land of the Muskakis, the chickadee, uh, and uh, I really love that we have an enormous number of chickadees. And behind me is the Chickadee River, the Columbia River, um, as we might know it. Uh, and here I am teaching a bunch of um, grade 10, 11 science students. So we were looking at resources and uh, this area has um, got a lot of silver and was sort of the whole town exists because of mining it's just down the valley from where I live in Revelstoke and um, we'll talk a bit about, more about how important place-based education is obviously I'm a little bit disparate in um, geography from you guys um, but that's really important to us. Um, so this is uh, a Sinaiqs map of uh, the Columbia Basin so Revelstoke's down here with the sturgeon nose canoe which the Sinaiqs people um, created and um, enabled transport along this incredible river highway. Um, I am no, a non-Indigenous person um, teaching on the land. So, so much of what I do and through our work with the Outdoor Learning Store is um, trying to elevate Indigenous voices, cultivate relationships uh, and deepen that practice. Um, so if anyone here would like to share the Indigenous uh, land that they're joining us from, if they do know it, um, please feel free to pop that in the chat now. Um, if not, perhaps take a moment to think um, a lot of the work I've done and the connections I've made have talked about that when, when we are, are out on the land is, is firstly just to show gratitude. So when I first get there, I say thank you um, to whatever landscape I'm in. I say thank you to Mother Earth. I say thank you to Grandfather Moon. Um, thank you to the water that brings life. Thank you to the trees. Um, so 
it just a, just a feeling of gratitude whenever I'm out in nature. Uh, I feel connects me um, and helps me deepen my my practice um, when I'm learning on the land. So I teach all kinds. I'm a community educator, um, a outdoor instructor. I'm an ACMG climbing instructor. I ride bikes and teach those. Um, but my real passion is environmental education. And I do this in schools and through my business. And uh, we're out here on a little walk. Um, thanks for sharing, people. I appreciate that in the chat. Um, this is again down by the river and we have this beach. Uh, and what we did as our sensory wake up on this walk um, was I give them a challenge. Firstly, over here, you might see on the far right of the screen, I've got a wagon with sit pads and somewhere to put all their stuff. Cannot express enough if you are in a place that has and this path is actually not very wagon friendly um but somewhere where you can take a wagon there are some like four by four ones that you can get they're a bit um more rugged um how great it is to have a sort of somewhere to deposit all of your stuff um i always keep my first aid kit uh in my backpack that's on me at all times just in case um but while we were here so sensory wake up is a really nice way i'd like to start with the walks so firstly i was just asking them about interesting things they've seen and they were putting their hands up um but I send them out and I ask them for the roundest stone that they can find and I give them two minutes and then we come back and we have a comparison there's no winning or losing it's just who what's their interpretation of the roundest or the smoothest or the most sparkly stone I ask them to find something yellow in nature I find them to ask random colors um and I find that it's it, you know a scavenger hunt but it just gets them thinking um and yeah that's one way with this sort of younger kids with the really litlies um here i am dressed as the spring sprite with flowers in my hair and all the colors um so this is part of a program called nature through the seasons that i run for wild site and um we go four times a year four different seasons um and this is our tree this is our beautiful paper birch behind the kids here and we track uh, our tree over those seasons um we take a picture with it. We think about what does the bark look like? Is there anything different there? Um, you know, what does the foliage look like? What is the ground around the tree? What's changed since we were here last? Uh, and I dress up as a different uh, winter sort of, I'm the winter witch in winter. I'm the spring sprite. Uh, I'm summery Sylvie, the fairy, I think in the summer I've got wings. Um, but really just creating some sort of character, especially essentially with the young ones if um you know if you're not the most comfortable out there creating a persona that you can take with you it just creates a bit of wonder to to get them focused on where you're going um but this is uh a, they're very lucky it's about 100 meters from their school it's like a little forest uh, edge that runs around and um yeah we we make a, a tree we adopt a tree and then we uh, we track him uh, every season Slightly older, uh, grade fives. Um, we live again on the banks of the Columbia River. So this is the uh, Arrow Lakes Reservoir. So it's um, seasonally flooded. And uh, we came down here, we're doing some water quality testing as my outdoor learning store kit and looking for macro invertebrate bugs. Um, but we had a big long walk up this um, sort of abandoned highway. So this was a road before they flooded this when they built uh, two dams on either side. So there's a lot of history and things you can um, go into it. Uh, but we spent a lot of time here thinking about, could I always walk? where I walk? Does this change over time or ephemerally, seasonally? Uh, and asking them, a lot of what I do is inquiry based. So um, really just asking them questions and asking them to, to follow that line of thought wherever it takes them. Um, so when we're walking, most of the time we have a task, we're thinking, we're doing something. So um, yeah, rather than them just sort of wandering without really sort of tuning into the environment. I've done some bigger walks with, um, this was taking um, some teenagers up. Um, this is Mount Begby um, in the Monarchies behind me. Um, you can't see the peaks, but um, that's the Begby Glacier, that ever shrinking patch of 
permanent snow there um and i don't know if you can know so these two girls are looking up at their objective but if you follow the right hand uh, girl up these steps you hit the snow line if you go right to where the snow finishes you might just see a diagonal crack horizontally but leading up along the rock that's actually a ledge you gain that ledge cross the glacier gain this ledge climb up here and then you climb up the ridge to the peak uh, so this was really a, a mountaineering introduction to mountaineering we camped for three days it's a 16 kilometer hike just to get um to the campground which is just behind this photograph um and so yeah some walks might be wilder than others um this was a really uh, i had an acmg mountain guide uh, with me i was tail guiding in this scenario and kind of more the sort of educational support person um but you know wild doesn't have to be this okay it's it's fun and amazing if you have these opportunities but it doesn't have to be this and it doesn't have to be this you don't have to be hanging off of rocks here we're training on a uh, rope rescue it could be down here next on this paved path next to the golf course that's adjacent uh, this is rundle rock in banff national park and so my thing is it's all about economies of scale uh, wild yeah doesn't have to actually mean remote um and if you are anywhere remote you know a good wilderness first aid qualification is imperative um but yeah as i hope you'll see we don't have to be doing any of this for it to be really exciting so here's just my little bit of thing you know converging evidence strongly suggests that experiences of nature boost academic learning personal development and environmental stewardship um I've hidden the thing, but this is from Frontiers in Psychology um, in 2019. Peer-reviewed research, I mean, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but peer-reviewed research shows that learning outside is it's not just a break from learning or being outside is not a break from learning. Um, it is essential for our physical and mental and emotional and social well-being, but it's also great for academic learning and 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 showing success in the sort of formal way so if you've got any resistant administrators or anything particularly on take me outside's website we've got a bunch of peer-reviewed scientific journals research that can support why uh, you might want to take your learning outside it also helps with parents or things and um yeah going back to this slide risk management is a really big thing uh, and i'll touch on it a little bit later Okay, so at the moment, um, particularly where I live uh, in the Kootenays in DC, um, environmental education is not very diverse. And uh, it's really important that um, for me to try and, and create um, a diverse uh, and inclusive um, learning environment. Um, here we are with um, Chief Mike. Um, they came from the Shushwap uh, Indian band uh, to share with us about the medicine people when we were out, uh, we were doing some planting uh, of native species into a provincial park and we were with people, with local people, with students, and they came to bless uh, the plants. And so, yes, indigenous perspectives, um, black, indigenous people of colour, it's incredibly important and where I live it's not a very diverse environment so I'm so grateful and blessed um, to have uh, the internet and to have this connection um, to places because then we can be more inclusive and we can reach people that might otherwise not have joined. We might not have big mountains and an endless space, we might live in a very urban or densely populated environment, well a silk tarp on snow or playground or field um, can create a whole magical kingdom underneath there. It doesn't have to be big mountains. We can make mountains with the top. We can make mountains with our bodies and our hands and soil. We don't need um, to be out there in, in these beautiful landscapes in order um, to have successful outdoor learning. Uh, and inclusivity is incredibly important. So wilderness uh, or a walk might not be very far. And it might be uh, like this walk that we were doing. This is a teacher training. Um, this is Karen Lai. Uh, she's a diversity um, and equity. Disability and equity inclusion uh, officer 
well, the person in charge for Vancouver, for the city of Vancouver, and she's an incredible speaker and more articulate than I am, um, and a great friend. So we're right behind the school here. This is a park that sort of backs onto the school. Uh, we've got a gas fire going. Um, and this was our wild uh, on this day. And so that was really important to recognize that you might not be able to go all the places all at once. All right, waking up our walks. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do, actually, is I'm just going to share um, some audio and I'm just going to do a sensory wake up um, that I would do with any age group while I was outside. And we're going to listen to some nature noises. So um, just hold on for just a moment. I'm just going to pause my... Oh, I stopped it. Never mind. Okay, hang on. Okay, so I'd like you to close your eyes. And I'd like you to rub your hands together, palm to palm, as fast as you can. Generate some heat. As I generate that heat, I think of the energy of all living things. And I'd like you to cup your ears. Take that energy, that heat, and cover your ears. And then open up your cups behind your ears. So they're like deer ears, big listening deer ears. And I want you to just listen. How many different sounds can you hear? Which sound is closer? Which sound is far away? I'm so sorry to interrupt Jade, but we can't hear your audio. No. Okay, well, thank you for telling me. <laughs> That's so important. Okay, hang on, let's restart. Can you hear it now? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Okay, thank you. I stopped my share so we had a moment. Okay, let's restart. So, eyes closed, hands together, rubbing our hands, feet, generating, feet, generating, taking that energy out of the universe and bringing it to ourselves. And first thing we cover our ears, feel that heat and breath traveling down. And then open up the cups. So you've got cups that you use behind your ears. So if the rain came down, you would catch it. Like big deer ears that can swivel and take everything in. And just listen. How many different sounds can you hear? Which sound is closest to you? And which is furthest away. Wherever you are, can you hear anything behind you? Which is the sound that you like most? Okay, release your dear ears, we're going to come back to palms together, rubbing our hands, waking up our senses, taking the energy out of the air. And this time we're going to cover our eyes. You don't have to touch them, but you can just cover your hands and feel the heat from your hands spilling into your eyes. And as you open your eyes, they are eager eyes. So looking directly in front of you, so you can open your eyes for this one. What do you see? What's the closest thing to you and what colour is it? What's the furthest colour away? Without moving your head, what's the furthest thing that you can see on your left side? What's the furthest thing you can see on your right? If you were going to choose one colour to describe what was in front of you, what would be the predominant colour? Let's 
say we're in the forest and it's green. How many different colours of green can you see? Okay, back together, hands, palms, rubbing together, generating that energy, generating that energy, rubbing, 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 and this time we bring to the nose. Take a deep breath in, sigh out. Try again, rub the hands, deep breath in, and breathe out. Can you smell anything where you are? Strong. Or perhaps there's an absence of smell. Can you close one nostril? As you breathe in or out, can you feel any sensation around your nostril of hot or cold? How about the other side? Okay. Last go. Here we are. Rub those palms together. Wake up your senses. Draw the energy of the earth up into your hands and cover your mouth. You don't need to touch it. You just hover above it. Now opening our mouths. We don't really, especially with kids, want to eat anything while we're out on our walks. But maybe you could open your mouth and stick out your tongue. See if you can taste anything in the air around you. Can you feel wind blowing? Does the air feel hot or cold? It wasn't the last one I like. This is the last one. We're rubbing our hands together, generating that energy, feeling that heat, and then just standing still, eyes closed, palms open and forward in a strong mountain pose. Can you feel your feet connected to the earth or your seat on your chair? Can you feel your clothes against your skin? Can you feel wind? Or heat anywhere in your body? As we finish, I want you to imagine eyes closed. I want you to imagine roots growing down, out through your feet. Down, 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 out, down through the carpet or the hardwood floor, wherever you are. Down through that, down through the foundations, out into the soil of rock buried beneath. Go down through the rock, down, finding all the passengers, places with water, with fungi, with mycorrhizal networks spreading out. Your roots go down, down, down. You are deeply connected to the earth. And then with those roots, I would like you to draw up. Draw up minerals, draw up water, draw up energy. Suck it up through those roots. And deep in the earth, all the way up through the cracks and the fissures in the rock, all the way up into your root system, through the soil, up through the floor, up into your feet. And that energy pulls up into your body, up through your feet, your lower legs, your knee, your thighs, up into your hips, your buttocks, your lower back, around into your belly. This golden light, this energy, this power lifts up from the earth, up through your belly, up into your chest, into your throat, down your arms. This beautiful white light, powerful energy wiggling your fingers as it shoots out there up through your head and out through the top and as that energy lifts out you close your eyes and then open your eyes normally i have uh, more screens on so i'm not really sure if anyone uh, was in there i had my eyes closed i suppose for most of it um but thank you i hope uh, you joined in and you can for me i will um edit that um, with younger students or older, but they are, I found some of my youngest kindergartners are the best at visualization, right? We haven't beaten the creativity out of them yet. So they, um, they love it. Oh, thank you for the nice feedback.
Okay, so waking up our walk, we just woke up our senses. And other things um, that I like to do um, for waking up my walk are a dozen touches, egg boxes, everyone can get those. Um, and I go out and we do this in all seasons and I ask them to find me 12 or a dozen different touches that could be different colors, that could be different textures, different um, rocks, anything that they can find great time to opportunity to introduce about responsible harvest about not pulling living things off of trees about not taking too much um so yeah found objects 12 different touches and then we kind of get to go on this exploration through nature in the seasons of ah okay is it easier to find a dozen touches in spring or summer than it is in winter and what's different about those touches and um you know is is there a different temperature like what what's different colors do we find so I really like to do that too um and then this we're just gonna go on a little walk so this really cool person does these amazing like 4k hd videos um of him walking and I chose this one just because it's in bc so this is where I live um I'm actually not exactly sure where this is. It might be on Vancouver Island. It might be Cathedral Grove. Um, but the last time I was there, it was just hammering rain. and was extremely um, possibly dreary looking. Um, so this looks really nice. So as I'm walking at any time, um, I really want the kids with me to be paying attention. So sometimes I give them roles. Sometimes I have the person up front is gonna be, oh, it is me, yes. You can tell I've watched this video. Normally I just start it to make sure it works. Um, okay, so I'm looking for a um, person at the front who's navigating. A little easy when you've got a pathway that you have to follow. Uh, the person at the back is um, the, the safety officer. They're making sure that everyone's there. I get three people to be looking for traces of animals any signs of life. I get three other students to be looking for different plants. A couple of people are on uh, interesting things. So they just, and then anytime we find something, they say interesting thing and everybody stops and turns around. Um, I normally have uh, one person who is the hydration station, especially in if it's hot. And then whenever they say hydration station, everybody has to drink water. So that's a nice way to um, encourage kids to drink water as well. When I'm out, I don't just want them looking around. So what I might say is, OK, you can only look down and around. So they have to look at their feet and what things they find there. And then I say eye level and they have to try and keep their heads very, very still and only look at that level. And then we might do a skywalk where we are in a place where they couldn't trip and fall over a cliff, for example, but they're looking up at the sky uh, and looking up in the upper canopy and what differences they can be, they can see. I really like um, if you're in this kind of place to maybe look at one of these root balls or get really close to something and really start to investigate um, say a tree trunk for example um one thing i've done that i've really enjoyed is, is shrunk my entire class with my laser gun until they're ant sized and then i asked them to investigate um a tree trunk or um a patch of grass in front of them as if they were the ant and what kind of obstacles and how would it feel to be an ant in that landscape so they can start to look at sort of spatial scales even there's some maths in there um other things i love to do when i'm in walks here is um is a silent walk especially if you've got a super rowdy class okay um silent walks um make a fist uh, and every time you hear a new sound it could be clothes rustling it could be birds chirping you're allowed to put a finger up and you walk silently until you have your hand up until the whole class has five okay so that really gets them tuning in and, and paying attention uh, sometimes if we've got bigger area to walk i ask them to tell me about different animals that might live in this landscape and then to devise a walk like that animal and i get them to do the actual animal walk as we go Um, the audio is three rubbish two, on this. Um, one action. No print spider. Oh, it's really quiet. Cool, Welcoming in peace. Calming. 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 
Okay, you can't really hear them, but these are my grade six students um, telling me about what nature means to them. And most of them say calming, peaceful, beautiful. Uh, this student at the end um, had collected a pet slug um, and put it back. I mean, normally I'm not super into animal collecting, but she isn't normally the most engaged student. And I was really stoked that she was in there and she'd gotten a piece of um, food for him as well. So she she really wanted to look after him. Um, the students have clipboards. So they had to draw four quadrants and I sent them out and they had to find uh, four interesting things to draw uh, and then to sit in a sit spot for um, six minutes and think. Uh, so I do a minute for their, eight, for their grade uh, and think uh, about a word or a phrase um, that nature meant to them um and then we recorded it and a lot of these students use technology but they are not very confident in public speaking or sharing so it's really lovely um even though they were really nervous um they were quite excited to share uh, their thoughts and their feelings and we'd spent all day out on on a field trip in this um, managed forest and it was a really special moment for them to capture it um three Okay, some walks um, when in, I'm in a more recreational sense or we're on a real field trip away from school grounds is, is awesome to do things about like survival skills or things that tie into their, their sense of self as a human. Maybe you can't have a big fire, but you can, most places um, have like a little pie dish like this and I, it's a five minute fire. So they have to collect all of the things that they think and then I give them a, a flint. Um, and they have to make it. And um, they were successful, these guys, and I was very proud of them. You might be able to have uh, a bigger fire, uh, in which case I suggest um, bringing some sort of snack and hot chocolates. We just had marshmallows and uh, my friend in blue over here, G, had made um, hot chocolate on my camping stove. Um, that can be a really amazing thing. And they were so independent. Um, face of the one in red, yeah. <laughs> Um, these are really, this is my, like one of my recreational uh, after school groups. Um, and we'd been out studying uh, rocks and things, but you can see they've got sit pads and um, they're dressed up. You know, some kids are wearing masks because it made them feel more comfortable. Um, and we had just a magical time. Um, so, you know, you don't have to have a fire to have fun, but if you can make it a little bit wild and, and that sort of exciting, um, they definitely uh, always love it. Um, here to a less enthusiastic group. Um, these are my grade nine students and we're doing some water quality testing. Um, what was interesting is that they, the local uh, city had sort of dug out this channel that drains, uh, drains our ski resort mountain, which is sort of off screen, right? Uh, and they wanted to improve the fish breeding um, pond, which is here. Um, so they dug it out, got rid of all of the vegetation, um, they got rid of all the vegetation on the bank where the students are standing. Um, and so, yes, fish like to hide. Uh, they also like shade. Um, and most fish have a really strict uh, environmental temperature um, gradient that they will be able to mate under. So um, this was really an exercise in what not to do. The other thing they did is they dug this channel um, and the stream creek flows in from the right to left and they didn't dig it on a steep enough angle. So all of the sediment just infills up into the culvert that drains the hill. Um, and so every six months they have to come and dredge this area, which of course does not, you know, encourage the fish to be there. Um, but we did water quality testing and these students were very reluctant to get off their phones. And as soon as I gave them a task, as soon as I gave them some chemical bottles of stuff, they were on it. So like we sell water testing equipment in the store that's like very simple, not super expensive and give them a task on this walk down to the river and they will engage. Uh, these are some of my teens when we were up uh, in the mountain. Uh, this is the mountaineering group we've been on this huge hike they were physically tired but not mentally tired and they didn't really know what to do and I said, there's no games no ipads no computers and i said okay i'd love you guys um to do a field sketch for me so this is actually me and my um extremely professional crocs in the mountains uh, that's where we came from down there and this is just the, the start of my sketch 
Uh, and this is one of my students who was really shy and was like, I can't draw, I can't draw. Um, and this was his field sketch of all the different layers. Um, and he was incredibly proud of it. So field sketching for me is an amazing thing that we can do. And a paste, piece of paper and a pencil or a field book that you um, give out every week on your weekly outdoor lesson or once a month, whatever you can do, um, it really helps them to develop and you can annotate, so you can practice literacy, you can just do art. Um, I found that it's really um, been extremely powerful um, for a lot of my students. Um, these are adults. We're out on a, um, this lady here is an ethnobotanist and we're out doing um, a walk looking at medicinal plants. So any age group, um, you know, if you're out with your students, what can you look at? And we were looking at um, the different textures of different plants and um, you know, is it a tall plant or a shrubby plant and why does it grow there and do you see it everywhere around? Um, and so just delving in, uh, even if you don't know the answers, just sketching and then you can use like a plant ID app or um, take pictures of it and then go back to class and do a research project and follow up. And then um, you don't have to be an expert in the plants in order to do uh, maybe a kind of little bio blitz or something like that. Um, this is me, this is me, my mini me. And um, this is, I'm a sort of trainee ski guide and this is, this is my mentor. Uh, and we're out there. Um, weather is pretty intense. Um, and I don't recommend, you know, ever taking students into avalanche terrain um, or anywhere where they could have that. But snow study is the most incredible thing. If you're out on a walk and it's freshly snowing, uh, having some simple magnifiers and um, a few of the books have just like photocopies that you can laminate of different. Um, crystal shapes and sizes, whether it's the stellar dendrites, these, you know, traditional perfect snowflakes or these column-like snowflakes or round balls, um, which is indicative of higher moisture levels, for example. Again, you don't have to be a scientist. A lot of the resources I'll share later uh, have this for you. But a uh, snow study um, has been something that I really, really enjoy. If you are lucky um, enough to have anywhere with a bunch of rocks, especially a sort of pebbly beach, um, or you can just go around and collect chunks of rocks or stones that you find in any kind of, you know, urban area in a at the edge of a park or bits of stuff off the ground. Um, but when we were here, I asked the students to find um, a stick, the length of their arm, four of those and put them on the ground. And then I asked them to sort the rocks. So we're doing classification and uh, critical thinking uh, and assessment and science. So um, got them to sort the rocks. Most of them either do, you know, size initially um, or color. And then I asked them, you know, what, what were the names of your categories though, right? So here they just had super big, I think, or like mahusive was one of the words and then quite big. And so then I asked them, OK, if I ask you again, could you break that? And with older students, right, I'm like, I want four categories minimum. OK, so then they have to sort them more carefully. And then you give them two minutes each round, first round, then the second round, they have to sort it by another classification. So if they did size, normally they do color. And then on the third round, we repeat again and they're like, what do we do? So then we start looking at texture. OK, so we might start seeing some metamorphic rocks where I live. That's pretty much what we see. Um, and then we can start to learn about where those rocks have come from. So I am a rock nerd, so I'm really into this. But it's amazing just to think um, that, OK, did these rocks start here? Where did they come from where they were traveled? Why are there any sharp rocks around? And then you start to look and in their sorting because these have been transported, right? So we start to talk about erosion and deposition and weathering and why they're all smooth because the water does it and that they were once part of the big mountain and they've traveled an enormous distance. And sometimes if you've ever been somewhere and just seen a giant boulder just sat in the middle of a field, normally that's what we call an erratic and that's come from glaciers and it has traveled enormous distances to be there. You know, if you're sitting in a valley, you can tell them that that valley once was filled with ice to the top or if you're looking at the land shape of a landscape and it's quite flat and it's like ah well water has smoothed this landscape over time 
another thing I like to do with rocks is you can have the students in a circle and you pick a rock up and you have them facing inwards with their eyes closed and you give them the rock and they have to feel it behind their back with their eyes closed and they pass it to their neighbor and it goes around and around and then you present them with three rocks they're somewhat similar and they have to say which rock is there then they have to tell you why and how they identified it oh there was that thick sort of um ledge halfway along and that's i see that so uh, if they're really struggling or they're younger you can give them the rocks to feel again and then they can um, make that assessment but yeah a little bit of a downtime we actually walk about 20 25 minutes from school to get to this spot so by the time they've done that they're ready for a sort of sit down rest and this sort of activity um kind of gives them that break Another thing we do in this environment is make ecosystems. I don't know if anyone's ever done this before, but I send different teams out. Again, talking about responsible harvest, this moss is extremely ubiquitous where we are. We live in the inland timber rainforest. It is very wet um, and it's everywhere. But I talk about not taking the first bit you see and not the last and not taking more than 10%. So also start thinking about percentages. So I tell them again, length of your arm is square and you're not taking more than um, this much of your sort of hand shape out of that whole patch. And then um, we've got sand, moss, soil and stones behind there. And then what I got the kids to do is they were lined up here, their teams, and they were lined up on the other side of the class. And I got them to answer um, in rows, uh, uh, you know, science-y or environmental question. And if they won, then they got to come forward and do their layer. And it was who could build their world the first, the fastest. And over here uh, is the completed um, jars. I got these jars for free from a local farmer who was getting rid of them, um, you know, a bit of baking paper and an elastic band. Um, this is a recycled um, like milk bottle cap filled with water. You need to have moisture in there. And then on a windowsill, like these will last for years. Um, and of course, in the right hand jar, you can see um, indigenous to Revelstoke is the Bengal tiger. Um, I've got a pretty obsessed with going to thrift stores and finding little bits and pieces. And it makes them really happy to put um, the animal in there. Um, but after about a week, the teacher called me and was like, there's bugs in the soil and they're coming alive and worms come out. And it is really fascinating. Uh, if it's ever not moisture, if you never see, sorry, if you look at the jar and you don't see moisture on the walls, then you need to take the lid off and put more water in your swimming pool. Um, but the kids love doing this. So firstly, they got to go on a walk. Um, this was all collected, yeah, about 10 minutes from the school. Firstly, they got to go on a walk. Secondly, they get to collect things and then they get to build something and create. Okay, so wilding up our walk. Um, if you are going a bit further afield, um, maybe even with older students as you're doing things, I really would like to ask you to celebrate individual wins. Um, these two students on the right here didn't make the summit of the mountain, but instead we went on a marmot hunt, um, not actually, um, but uh, going to, to watch them and learn from them. And we went and sketched alpine wildfire flowers um, because they didn't feel comfortable going for the peak and that's just fine um, so knowing people's limits and where they're at um, if you're out on any kind of big adventure and it's wet you could find or make shelter so building shelters works with every age group um, we were looking on this left one it's hammering rain um, we were supposed to be rock climbing but it was hammering rain actually yeah and I've always got a black bin liner for various emergency things and so we were collecting sticks underneath the rock and that was the kids ideas I was like okay how are we going to start a fire it's super wet um, and this was their plan so we actually spent about an hour finding this and had a fantastic fire uh, and warmed up um younger kids so this is like natural um sort of shelters we found and then they were just adding on to them with like these sticks on the right here uh, and these some other students and um yeah he's up on that stick Okay, he's up on that log. So let's talk about risk in, in the wild. Um, as a first aider and my husband's a paramedic, like the mechanism for spinal injury is generally double height, double your height. If you fall from that height, then there is enough. 
uh, force to create a spinal injury. So he is not double his height. Uh, he's holding onto this log. And I'm sure you might have seen him on social media, but there are these things like rather than like, be careful, do that. I say to them, I'm like, cool, how are you going to get down? He said, oh, yeah, I'm just going to walk back this way and push on that tree. Super. OK, um, just know if at any point you feel uncomfortable, I'm here to help you get down if you need me. Cool. Thank you. Carry on. Risky play is so integral to young people's ability to make decisions, um, make choices um, and manage their own behavior uh, to avoid injury. So I'm a big believer. Um, if I had, you know, I've been rock climbing with kids and they've been waiting and they're starting to boulder. No, not OK. Um, and really depends on the substrate as well. But same for your playground, you know, you could take them into the playground of your school um, and get them moving around without touching the ground. Um, can you do it um, not using your right hand? But again, having them really a low ground, a low level. Um, can you walk um, and move from object to object? Can you walk where you're always touching something with your hands in the nature so that you start doing all of these arm movements and things there's lots of opportunities to do this maybe even if you don't have a big old forest um i'm up here um as said husband uh, we're up on a big cliff that's the river jordan below us and these are my natural leaders this group of students um alex and i are using our body as a boundary for the high risk so you know, you can create those spaces uh, without being like, don't go over the edge, don't look over the edge, because all you're going to do is draw them over there. Um, but using your body as, as a boundary can really work. Um, yes, always know where you are. You might think, oh, we're only just going around the corner, but have a paper map, ideally, uh, and a compass or a dedicated GPS that's separate from your phone. So if your battery dies, um, this is, again, 10 minutes from the school in the sort of wetlands area, but it's really easy to get turned around. Um, and so we were here with talking about navigation. Um, one of the things I love to do with kids is navigation. So teaching them how to do um, use a compass, if you don't know there's you know some youtube videos there's some books that have really simple instructions and then what i do is create um a very simple start point head on a bearing um or head east um for 100 meters so then they have to start pacing out big meter steps and you can show them what a meter looks like and then probably know and then at each station that they get to there is a prize it's normally a bag of sweets um i'm ashamed to say but from that place, then they go. You might have two separate sets of clues for different teams. Um, but sending them on an adventure where they have to sort of use their brains to find things is just an amazing way to wild up your walk with your students. If you've ever got adults with you, maybe you volunteer parents or teachers or a teacher on call or a teacher in training, um, adults still need instruction and clear instruction. So always make sure you give them instruction as if they were the students or make clear that you're speaking to them as well. Otherwise, you might have some interesting scenarios, which I definitely have. Here with my grade 11 climate change class, devising the plan. So we ask them, um, how we could best we were doing uh, biodiversity transects and I was asking them how would they would they set it up we need a comparative site and where would they go and why um, and then I got them to use their phones to take pictures for a plant ID they're the experts and then we went back um, and we worked out our biodiversity index with some math and they um, ID'd their plants using um, technology over here on my right is one of my favorite things to do on a walk with students and it was given to me it's called rotational interpretation you might call it something else and you might have done it I don't know but I had never done it before I came to Canada um young people taking the teaching so in vision we're at you need about maybe 500 meters, depends on the size of your class, but you start at the same point. Now, what I generally do is I have uh, the teacher or any volunteer support stay, and you can do this just around your schoolyard as well, but teacher at the back. Um, she's got like a simple 
trivia quiz about nature that you could print off the internet or create your own or whatever. And she's keeping them busy. First group, say the group standing on the left here, come with me and I find an interesting plant, the cedar tree, um, and I teach them three facts about it. You know, that um, cedar has an incredible um, spiritual connection for the indigenous people of our area. Um, cedar, you can use to boil in tea and it's got anti-inflammatory pr properties. Um, and cedar is used as one of the most successful building um, materials on earth, right? So you teach them three facts, get them to repeat it. Normally you have three or four in a group, you get a fact per person. And then the next group from the teacher comes along. The, te the group I've just taught teach their facts to the newcomers. And then the newcomers carry on with me down the path. I teach the newcomers their facts and they stay put. Group three comes from the teacher. They come to group one and learn about the cedar. They go to the newcomers and learn about whatever they've learned about. And then they carry on to the next spot. So you end up with this boom, 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 boom of students. Then when we're at the last group, last group and teacher comes along, they learn from cedar group. Then we take cedar group with us and we all go to the newcomers. Newcomers teach us. The whole group moves to the last group. So eventually every single group will have met every single person and they all did the learning themselves. Firstly, they listened to me say it. Then they memorized it. And then um, they taught it back. So it's an amazing way to get them to absorb and remember information. And I found it to be just like incredibly um, successful. Okay, before we do this, I'm wondering if people can have their um, typing fingers ready, okay? Um, I won't force you to turn your cameras on and um, speak, but um, have your fingers typed. So looking at this picture on the right, um, I'd love you to use, type in the chat some words to describe what you see in the picture on the right. Any words that you want? Shale, okay. Freedom, nice, fast. Trees, okay, beautiful. Contentment, mountains, ooh, nice, I like it. Okay, so Erica, I'm gonna start with you, Shale. Um, I am an alien. I've come from outer space uh, and I know not what you speak of when you say shale. So could you explain what shale is? Um, Nancy, what, what does vast mean? What, what is a vast? What is a vast? Um, Sarah, trees, we don't have them on my planet. Could you explain what a tree is? Uh, Joseph, uh, I don't know what mountain means. Could you could you explain? Uh, Jacob, I see a dragon poking its head out of the rock. Nice. <laughs> I think I see that too now. Okay, I don't know what a dragon is. Could you explain? Alison Cloudy, what's a cloud? Linda, what does rugged mean? Okay, so each of you, I want you to imagine the word that you've typed, I have no idea what you mean. So Erica, okay, she went from shelter, dark mineral ground cover, rock. Often slippery when we're all trippy when you walk over it. Okay, what's a rock? Go again. Anyone else got their uh, their second description? For the alien who's just landed on this planet, has never, ever been here before, has no idea, doesn't really speak, can, can understand English, but has no concept of what those words actually mean. Have a think how you would delve into that description. Water suspended in the sky, bring a raincoat. I like that, okay. All right, what's sky? Ellison, what's the sky? You get a mythical made up animal, living being that can breathe fire, hot. Ooh, I like. Up high, jagged formations, depth. Cool. So I play this game with students and um, asking them to um, a really, really big, wide and tall area for fast. Okay, nice, right? Um, I love playing this game to get them to develop their descriptive skills about the landscape. 
Right, trees are standing, grow upwards towards the sky. They have many arms, and here you will see they are soft and bristly to the touch. Nice. Okay. So, you know, and then I might say, um, what's touch? And you can go down this rabbit hole. You could do this while you're having lunch. You can do it while you're having a water break. Um, but getting them to put their mind into a less familiar state can be incredibly helpful um, for students. Mountains are massive formations that are steep and rocky. This is hard, right? Isn't it just? And so it's really, it challenges you for, <laughs> to think of the, um, the sort of preconceptions about understanding what we understand. Okay, a rock is a hard object. It can be big and immovable or small and light, smooth or bumpy, shiny or dull. They can be made of any color and are formed in one of three primary ways. Ooh, nice, Erica, going deep, right? And you don't have to go that deep, but just changing the language that you use um, to, to get them to, yeah, it's all about communication. And I, I did a geography degree at first and like, Geography is the communication of science. It's the ability to um, share all this technical knowledge in a way that um, is interesting. Um, okay, we're gonna talk a little bit more about these things. So 100 meter field trip, right? Not going anywhere from your school, backyard, wherever you are. Um, so firstly, you can do that in your schoolyard, that exercise, that works great, you know, and then you start to get these sort of man-made objects and things, it's super cool. Um, okay, the one on the left, I have to credit um, GEOC, the Global Environmental Outdoor Council, they're based in Alberta. Um, you can get this PDF um, of their five minute field trips and um, there's lots of options and this is some of the, I like their drawings, so I'm borrowing them. Um, okay, so the one on the left, um, I don't know if you can see, but there's little things hidden. So I get like 20, 30 different objects, maybe even more cheap stuff from the thrift store and then before class you go and hide it along your walking trail right it could be on fences it could be a you know a bow on a twig bottle caps on the ground things that are brightly colored and you ask your kids uh, to go out and find as many things as you can make sure they're up high down low side to side uh, and you know winner whoever brings the most things back but asking them to pay attention uh, anything that helps them pay attention is amazing um, if you do have blindfolds um, or, you know, kids can use toques in the winters or whatever, but I love this. Um, if you have any trees, um, is uh, one student's blindfolded and the other student um, takes them blindfolded. So it's a trust exercise as well, right? So this is bonding uh, to a tree and gives them a minute to feel the tree, feel its sort of branches, feel the shape, feel the whirls on the bark. And then they spin them around a few times and walk them in a really circuitous walk back to a spot. Then they have to go and find their tree after they've done that and they have to assess it, you know, by touch and, you know, been by sight, translating that touch into sight. Uh, and that can be a really amazing exercise. You can also do this with um, which part of the playground am I on or which bench, you know, or which part of the school, like lots of opportunities to do that. My other one down here um, is, is, is build a park. So you can do this literally on a sort of bare ground or um, on the field or um, anywhere close by. Um, and they're going to build a park. So what you're asking them to do is to look for the small things, stones and stuff, and to use their imagination to show you like, oh, I'm going to build a, a, a nature theme park. And this is the slides and this is the roller coaster where they go. Or maybe they're building their perfect city um so you're going to ask them to um show what it is okay did they build their park is there any water can humans live without water can animals where do the an are there any animals where you live and asking them and you can go delving deep even some of the older classes i've done this with like go really really deep into uh, building a perfect city and then you're starting to ask them what's important to them and what they care about so um those are my 300 meter field trips within um the things also yeah any of the other things we've spoken about before so here are some tools and resources so we're a non-profit um social enterprise um and we sort of came about because there wasn't a place in canada that we could get 
um, outdoor learning equipment and resources. Um, you know, especially that are sort of ethically um, produced and sourced. And so we made the outdoor learning store. And here are some of my big favorites if you are learning outdoors. So the Big Book of Nature Activities has runs everything by season. It is North American wide and they have different bits for different ecosystems or like Pacific Northwest or Eastern or Central. Um, so you can tailor it. Dirty teaching, if you really want to take your teaching outside and don't quite know where to start, Juliet Robertson is a genius. They're like little sort of paragraphs this wide of, of activities that basically require no prep and no equipment. And you just go in and then there's a couple of ideas for sort of follow ons. If you're looking more into something that's like we're going to take a, a program and we're going to run it all year round and it's going to be related to food, uh, science, ecology, then the school garden curriculum is for you. It, can also help you if you have a school garden on how to do that or how to build it or how to integrate that into your learning. Um, but it's a lot to do with seasonality and growth stages. And so there's a lot of really deep stuff in there. Um, as you could tell me playing audio and stuff, I'm obsessed with, with sensory stuff. Um, Remy Rodim, we've actually sold out of all of his stuff at the moment. You can get him on Spotify and just listen, like his channel. His music he's from the Yukon like songs like let's get drastic with our plastic or what's that habitat sequa levitat like it they've all got actions he's the songs are so uplifting but they're all about the environment about different animals about things um and I like to start my day with the kids with a bit of a sing and a dance and um they love it if you're looking um, for a resource that takes indigenous perspectives in and there's about inquiry based, like you're trying to plan lessons to take on your walks, then Natural Curiosity is just the book for you. Um, it goes through the sort of five different pathways um, of um, environmental inquiry and connects into land based learning just beautifully. So I uh, highly recommend um, other indigenous resources like reading stories from your local indigenous people. We partner with Strong Nations here and they have bundles that have um, groups of books that are related to most areas on Turtle Island or Canada. And this book is new. Um, it was produced in conjunction with Green Learning and it was written by three indigenous young women and illustrated by an indigenous woman. Uh, and it's a story of one girl's journey um, through a landscape and how she connects with nature. And it, there's more realistic tales about looking after animals and plants and it's beautiful um highly recommend if you're out sometimes equipment can give kids a purpose if it's a magnifier nets for pond dipping a clipboard with a scavenger hunt on it or a basic field book like these are 10 bucks they're waterproof they're tear proof um, and then kids can go on and do these things and you don't have to be an expert you don't have to uh know exactly we can just look at it and then look at the picture and say oh yes i think so uh, and i don't go anywhere without a sit pad like even as a ski tourer um i have one in my backpack it makes great snow barrier if you ever had anyone in a first aid situation they can move um and they work nice as a sort of spine padding if you've got loads of stuff in your bag Kids love to, to watch birds. We have kids size binoculars and I can't recommend bird watching with kids enough. Uh, it makes them settle, makes them stop for a second and really focus. The so stuff I was doing with those older kids was using one of these kits to do water quality testing. And then there's the capacity to really like, you can report your data to um, Living Lakes Canada, to um, the government even, and become real citizen scientists with your kids. And that makes me really happy that the tools exist to do that um, another thing I'm really into is night walks so it could be straight after school for an after school outdoor ed club um, in the winter when it's dark so we have these laminated guides they glow in the dark which is quite fun but they talk about the constellations one of the things I've been using is this free app called Stellarium uh, and it is the most incredible it gives you the entire night sky exactly where you are in your location and whichever direction you're facing it has all the names it has all the history and allegorical stories connected to different constellations and then you can go out and try and find things um so it's it's become like a really fun thing that i do erica no stellarium yeah it is amazing i'm trying to think of what it is the word it's a 
I want to say astrology. It's not. It's whatever the word is where you look at the stars. Astronomy. Through. It's astronomy. Astronomy is the study. But what's the thing? Like we have one in in the UK where you can go and you can look at all the stars on the ceiling. Planetarium. Planetarium. There oh, we go. Thank you. <laughs> Gosh, Sorry. that was killing me. So you can tell I don't use that. And I would put my um, camera on, but I haven't moved my computer, so it's on the kitchen table, and I'm so heavily backlit, it's not pleasant. So, oh, but I'm not no reorganizing my kitchen right now. <laughs> <laughs> I like you, moon. Um, thank you. Sometimes, if we see the moon in the sky, I encourage my students to shout, "Hey, you space egg! You're supposed to be asleep." Uh, and then we can talk about why you can still see the moon in the daytime. Uh, and an app like Stellarium, um, there are some YouTube uh, tutorials that I highly recommend. And then once you've got it, it is incredible. And you can watch the way the, the moon works. And I have never found, I haven't found thus far a better way of connecting kids with orbital motion, which if you want to talk about climate, you ask nine out of 10 adults, what causes the climate on our earth? Oh, well, the sun. Yes, what about it? Well, it is orbital forcing. It is the way we move around the sun, the shape of our orbit, the tilt, the wobble that happens over long term periods. And some of these kids get it before adults, right? So I really enjoy uh, connecting kids with that. Okay, how are we doing? Almost there. Um, a walking curriculum. I could not talk about wild walks without this book. Gillian Judson is one of my heroes. This book is this thin, it's like four, four mil thick. And again, like dirty teaching, it is short things. So they, she has a lovely and an unlovely walk. So asking students on a walk to identify things they think are lovely or unlovely, why? Would you, how would you feel if the lovely things were gone? How would you feel if the unlovely things were gone? How do you know that you think this is lovely or not? There's a cracks walk. So if you're in an urban environment, finding cracks, following that crack as far as you can find it. What caused the crack? What's inside the crack? What's the longest crack you can find? OK, this book is genius and requires zero equipment to go with it. If you're out in nature um, and you've got um, younger kids, David Sobel's anything, but his place-based education book really connects you, how you can connect your learning with the space you're in in that moment. Green teacher teaching kids and teens about climate change. Some of them are run around games like the carbon dioxide game where you're in two circles and the sunbeams have to get into the earth and back out into the atmosphere without being tagged. If they get tagged, they're part of the CO2 greenhouse gas. Like it's amazing. Uh, and then there's also these discussion points that I really like. And if you're out on a walk, starting to learn to identify invasive species that you have. Firstly, you can start, then you can do a citizen science or um, a stewardship program where you pull invasive species. There's generally an invasive species group nonprofit that will support you in this and provide you with gear. It's just like an amazing project you can do with kids. And lastly, it's for you. OK, so for older students or for you, is you having a feeling of, of empowered, being empowered and, in, and, and joyful in this landscape um, will translate down. So uh, Braiding Sweetgrass for me was like an incredible book. Robin Wall Kimmerer, she's an indigenous woman and biologist and like changed the way that I look at the world. Um, and again, as a non-indigenous person, I grew up in Europe. I didn't really know about indigenous perspectives or history. We, you know, go back to World War One and the Romans, like those are like the two things we concentrate on. Um, so this was just beautiful. It touched me, it changed the way I view uh, nature and I'm so grateful for that book. Uh, Groundswell is um, again, indigenous written and a call to action. They're like these essays that are very powerful you can read them to a class you can read them uh, to yourself before a walk to really sort of engage that thinking part of the brain and the last one is the people's curriculum for the earth this has got like a bunch of cool stuff like where you can put them in groups and they have to become a different uh, indigenous nation at a summit where they have to give their points of view there's these cards which you could photocopy you could take it outside and have a forum um, there's lots of opportunities there for them to learn to communicate and articulate themselves and i love doing those kind of acting things outside because i feel like they're less self-conscious when they're outside and have a bit of space uh, than when like noise is bouncing off of walls 
Um, all of these are available in the store, you know, like not here is the salesperson. These are resources and there are plenty of uh, beautiful resources, out, free resources out there as well, like Geoc, Take Me Outside, Learning for a Sustainable Future. Uh, any of the partners that we have um, are providing. And if you need any support, you can go to our partners page and uh, you'll find a list and click through links to take you there. And breathe out. Okay, that's it. That's all. Um, I wonder if you have any questions or you want to share anything um, before we close up in the last couple of minutes here. Um, and no stress if not. <laughs> I hope I hope there were some ideas in there and not just ramblings of a mad woman who spends too much time amongst the trees. <laughs> uh, Jade, I. Uh Thank you. I don't, I, I know that uh, we're all, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm still standing, thinking about all of the things that are underneath my feet and the power that is going through my arms, like from, the, from that uh, sensory exercise you did. It was awesome. And, oh, and the kids else. love that one. Like they love it. Even the littlies like get into it, you know, and it's, you don't have to be like, I'm, I'm definitely not like a yoga person or instructor or anything. So thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm also going to be an alien tomorrow on my walk. That is. Yes, be an alien, bring your alien ray gun, shrink them down, get them to investigate a tree or a piece of, you know, and you could do this as well with like a bit of string, give them, um, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters of string, and then they have to be an ant along that whole path, and that can totally work. So uh, I'm just getting yes. a lot of thank yous in the in the chat there. I know that you had some ideas on how you wanted to to um, do your special prizes, so take it away. Okay, right. Um, everybody, it's going to be a typing, and I'm going to have two winners. So it's the first two people to complete. So listen carefully and no cheating, no typing until all of the instructions are done. And I say, ready, steady, go. <clears throat> so uh, this was all about uh, wilding up our walk. Uh, I can get rid of this now. Sorry, I'm just going to stop share. Uh, so without using the words wild, walk, okay, I'll just go with them, wild and walk, without using those two words, I would love for the first person to type me three words on one line with just a comma in between. Uh, don't hit enter, otherwise it makes the waterfall too hard to read. Three W words, except wild and walk, that can you feel that you connect with after this or that come to your mind when you think about being outside in nature. So three words, here we go. Oh, I didn't say go, Sarah, but it was... <laughs> go, everyone, go! Full start full start i'll let you in water wonder wow weather water wind okay sarah and joanna um if Alison or janelle can give me your email for the registration list um wonderful winsome wonder, wonder. oh i like that uh, this is another exercise i did with kids um and asked them to give me a three word or whoever's birthday it is that day then their first letter of their name or we go through the whole alphabet if people are lagging behind or whatever on a walk um so yes well done sarah e and well done joanna paul uh, i think these guys will send me your email and i will send you a 50 dollar gift card in the mail so you can definitely buy one of those books or five field guides, one pair of binoculars and a sit pad, all kinds of jazz. Um, I'm so appreciative to have been here and I'm really aware of um, everybody's time and Zoom time. So I am going to say thank you so much. Um, and I'm, I'm finished. Thank you for joining me.